Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you The Pied Piper, starring Frank Morgan, Margaret O'Brien, and Senior Hasso. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. On the eve of a great national election, I believe there's one thing on which we all agree. That is, that the hope of the world tomorrow rests on the children of today. It is they, the young people, who will make this tired old world a better place in which to live. Tonight's story, The Pied Piper, a hit picture from 20th Century Fox, tells how a handful of youngsters trapped by the Nazi invasion of France in 1940, become attached to an amazing old gentleman who is allergic to children. That amazing old gentleman is played by Frank Morgan, who's making a new picture at Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, Hold High the Torch. And tonight he's supported by Sweden's distinguished actress, Senia Hasso. And one of the children whom he saves for posterity is seven-year-old Margaret O'Brien, who has recently completed her Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Technicolor picture, Meet Me in St. Louis. Young as she is, Margaret O'Brien is already a veteran of the Lux Radio Theater, having captured all our hearts last season in Lost Angel. I said then, and I repeat now, that I've been watching stars on stage and screen for half a century, and I've never seen a finer emotional actress. And speaking of children, I have in my hand a letter that I wish you could all see. It's written not only in pencil, but also in Braille, the international language of the blind. And it comes from a group of sight-troubled children at a school in Minnesota. These last two lines say, Every Monday evening, we listen to your Lux Radio Theater and like it very much. We also use Lux Toilet Soap and think it is very good. I believe that's the first time the Lux, that Lux Toilet Soap has ever been praised in Braille. And to those children, I send our warmest thanks and hope our Lux Radio Theater continues to bring them happiness. And now it's curtain time, and we're ready for the first act of The Pied Piper, starring Frank Morgan as Mr. Howard, Margaret O'Brien as Sheila, and Senior Hassel as Nicole. This is the story of an English gentleman named Mr. Howard, who became the father of six children, all in the course of a few days. This sounds a bit incredible, but it's even more incredible when you take into account the fact that Mr. Howard didn't even like children. No, 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 no. It's not that I dislike children. I assure you I've never disliked children. It's simply that they make me feel uncomfortable. They... Well, children are too bright. It was in the summer of 1940 that I first met little Sheila Cavanaugh and her brother Ronnie. We were staying at the same inn in France, a quiet little place at the foot of the Alps near Switzerland. I'd been fishing there for a few days. Rather fair luck, too. I remember I came back to the inn one evening with my catch. The children were reading in the lounge, and Madame Pica was, as always, standing in back of the little hotel desk. Ah, Monsieur Howard, you have good luck today, eh? <laughs> Two very fine trout, Madame. One for me and one for you for supper. Monsieur, what an accomplishment. <laughs> Two of them. Yes. Look, children, are they not beautiful? My father caught five today. Oh, did he? Probably fishing with worms. Oh, no, sir. He was fishing with an artificial fly. Yesterday he caught ten. Oh, really? Is that so? Ah, oh, but children, your father is such a young man. Monsieur Howard, you must be tired. Sit down, rest. I will take the fish to Emily in the kitchen. Well, thank you, madame. Mr. Howard. Uh, what do you want? I've just been doing my lessons. Will you help me, Mr. Howard? 
Help you? Young woman, is uh, is that regarded as ethical? Hmm. Oh, it's quite all right, Mr. Howard. Everyone helped Sheila. Oh. You see, I have to name five states in the United States. And the only one I can think of is Texas. Uh, Texas, yeah. Uh, well, now, let's see. Uh, Texas, and then there's uh, California. Cali- ca- ca- right, California. And uh, Virginia. Virginia and cigarettes, you know. Virginia? Yes, and uh, uh, Rochester. Rochester? Rochester is an estate, Mr. Howard. Really? Then may I ask what it is? Rochester is a city. Oh, well, it may very well be a city, madam, but I don't deny that. I only contend that it is also a state. A state somewhat north and a bit to the northeast of uh, the New England colony. But it's not, Mr. Howard. It's just a city, and that's all. It's a city in the state of New York. Did anyone ask you? No, sir. Then you'll be doing me a great favor by keeping your irresponsible conjectures to yourself. Yes, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Daddy. Evening, Mr. Howard. Yeah, good evening. Hello, Dad. Hello, son. Anybody tried the wireless this evening? We ought to be able to get some English news if Berlin hasn't jammed it. Daddy, is Rochester in the United States a city or a state? Rochester? Rochester's a city, of course. Why? Mr. Cavanaugh, have you any corroboration for that reckless statement? Or is that simply your offhand opinion? I'm afraid I don't understand, sir. Mr. Howard told Sheila that Rochester is a state. Well, I must admit I've never heard the question raised before, but... And what would you say, sir, if I informed you that I myself have visited the state of Rochester? In that case, naturally, I'd be compelled to admit that you were right, sir. Listen, Daddy, are your planes? Listen. Yes. Quite a few, I imagine. That German man, the Heinkel. She can tell by the motors. Ronald. Ronald, those planes again. Yes, dear. That German, Mother, I can tell. I heard them going over this afternoon. Where could they have been, Ronald? I don't know. I can't understand it. The fighting is all up north in Belgium. Yes. Unless things are worse than we've heard. Is the wireless working? Is there any news, monsieur? There ought to be. It's just about time. Twice they passed today. Where are they going? Where? Here we are. I've got it. This is the overseas service of the British Broadcasting Company, London Calling. It would be idle to deny that Britain today faces a dark hour. More channel ports, French as well as Belgian, are now under German occupation. We must prepare to face any eventuality, even invasion. In this hour of darkness, let Englishmen, wherever they may be, in whatever lands beyond the sea, hear again by transcription the words of the Prime Minister before the House of Commons this morning. And be of good heart. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, on the landing grounds, in the fields, in the streets, and on the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for one moment believe, this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, will carry on the struggle until, in God's Ronald, turn it off. Ronald. It is worse than we thought. Yes, but we are well out of it here, eh, Monsieur Howard? They will never fight this far south. We could hide out here for years, and for you and me at our age, Monsieur Howard. That is a very comforting thought. Have you finished? Well, yes, Monsieur. Then allow me to inform you, sir, that if ever again you address one word to me, I shall take the greatest of pleasure in thrashing you within an inch of your life. Regardless of your age. Yes, sir. Madame Picard, there's a train for Paris at nine o'clock, isn't there? Why, yes, monsieur. I but... shall be taking it. Please arrange with the station master for my reservation to London by way of Paris and Saint Malo. But, monsieur, you have only been here three days. Three days of which I am heartily ashamed. 
I'll pack my things at once. Mr. Howard. Yes? I hope you're not being hasty because of anything this man has said. I can assure you that no one here believes for one second that you're here for, well, for any but the best of reasons. No. I'm here because, because I'm a selfish and pig-headed old man. I offered my services to every department of the government in London. I'm not without experience, you understand. But I, I was not needed. I was too old. In all of London, I was taken seriously by but one man, my vicar. He suggested to me that I knit. Knit for the soldiers. I'm afraid that I took some exception to his well-meant suggestion, but to run away like a sulky child was wrong, and I'm deeply ashamed of myself. That's not my point, sir. As you say yourself, you're not young, sir. There is no other point. Young or old, an Englishman's place at a time like this is in England. And if the trains are running, I shall be there in 18 hours to knit. An hour later, I was in my room, still packing, when Mrs. Cavanaugh asked to see me. She seemed quite strained, nervous. Mr. Howard, do you know what my husband does? No, I can't say I do. He is an official of the League of Nations at Geneva. And in Geneva, they think that Switzerland is very likely to be invaded next. Do they really? That's where we're going tonight. Back to Geneva. But is that very wise if there's danger there? It happens to be his post of duty. I see. But if, if Hitler does come, there won't be much food. There never is under him. I'm thinking of the children... Oh, yes? Mr. Howard, would you take them with you back to England? Do what? Would I do what? It would only be to Plymouth. My sister would meet you there, and I know it's asking an awful lot, but Well, you, I... you, you, you mean that, I, that that girl, too? Oh, please, please, she didn't mean to be rude. Sheila's really a very good child, and she'll behave, I promise you. Mrs. Cavanaugh, please. I... No, 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 it's impossible. I'm sorry, but it's, it's out of the question. Really, I couldn't. I simply couldn't. That night, I left for Paris with Sheila Cavanaugh and her brother, Ronnie. Are we taking the train, Mr. Howard? Of course we are. Yes, yes, we are. And will we sleep on the train, will we? I expect so, yes. He won't. What's that? He won't sleep on the train. What do you mean? Why won't he? Because he always gets sick on the train. Sick right on the floor. <laughs> I don't either. You do. I don't. No, Ronnie, of course you do. I do not. Now, please, please, let's not dispute the fact. Time will tell us who is correct, I'm afraid. <clears throat> the argument was settled an hour after we boarded the train. Ronnie was quite sick. With the kind aid of a French lady on the train, I took care of Ronnie as best I could. The French lady had a child of her own. She seemed to understand these things. Are you comfortable, Mon Oui, madame. Oh, he speaks French, yes? Uh, madame, what, uh, what seems to be the trouble with him? He is sick, monsieur. Oh, yes, that I understand. I told you he'd be sick. Quiet, you, quiet. It is train sickness, monsieur. But besides, he has fever. Fever? Maybe he has eaten something. Maybe he has been too hot in a draft. That is the way it is with children. Well, but does he need a doctor? Oh, no, no, no. If he can rest a little while and keep warm, he will be all right soon. I see. Well, Sheila, how are you? Oh, very sick, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Where is little Rose? Rose? Yes, see. See, my son? Réciter pour le petit garçon. Monsieur, Rose will recite for your sick little boy. He'll enjoy it. Mm, well, thank you. How do you do, Rose? Comment allez-vous, monsieur? Alors, Rose, réciter. Ma grand-tante, une mère à tout. Dans une maison, avec une servilleuse, avec une petite souris. Mr. Howard, why are we stopping here? I don't know, but I shall certainly find out. Uh, don't move. I'll be right back. Just a moment, my good man. I want to know when the next train leaves for Paris. To Paris? There is no more trains to Paris, monsieur. 
Nor trains to the north at all. But I hold tickets. I shall report you to the management. Monsieur, do you not understand? The Germans have crossed the Marne. Maybe the trains will never run again. Never? But I have two small children. At your age, monsieur, that is undoubtedly magnificent. <laughs> but if this is a contest, I have nine. Now look here. Mr. Howard, what is it? Sheila, is... I told you to stay on the train. Listen, there's a bus outside to shop. Shot? Why shot? There's a train here to San Melo. The chef de guerre just told me. Well, then let's catch it. By all means, come along. Well, this was a bit of luck, all right. I must say, Sheila, this bus idea was very clever of you. Very clever indeed. Thank you, sir. Yes, I expect that if you could break yourself of a certain insufferable pig-headedness, you'd be almost bearable. Are you comfortable, Ronnie? Yes, sir. Come and tell you, monsieur. Well, well, little Rose. So you caught the bus, too, eh? Fine. And uh, where's your mother, little Rose? That wasn't her mother. That was her aunt. Well, where's her aunt? Good heavens, did we leave her behind? Well, uh, yes, Mr. Howard. What is this? Don Marie de Papier. Da, 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 what are you muttering to her? I'm asking her for a piece of paper her aunt gave her. Voila. Here it is, Mr. Howard. There's something written on it. Henri Tenoir, Dickens Hotel, Russell Square, London. I don't understand. Who is this Henri Tenoir? That's Rosa's father. He's a waiter. But of what possible interest could his address be? Oh, so that's it. I'm to burden myself with another female child. But, Mr. Howard, they haven't any house. The Germans burned it down, and they haven't anywhere to go at all. Don't you see? Yeah. Come one, come all, eh, woman? But you wouldn't want them caught by the Germans, would you? That is not the point. <laughs> well, don't cry, Rose. <laughs> no pretty pa. Mr. Howard, I'd rather <laughs> like you. Don't you see? Rose can take care of Ronnie, and I can take care of her, so you'll have no bother. Yeah, that's all very neatly arranged, eh? <laughs> well, perhaps I have something to say on the subject. I do not propose to become the mecca of every unfortunate child in France. No, sir. When we get the shop, I shall turn her over to the authorities and leave it to them to get her back to her aunt. Yes, sir. It's the only intelligent way to deal with such situations. Yes, sir. Ronnie... Would you tell Rose what Mr. Howard is going to do? All right. Rose. We... Rose. Yeah, this is just a moment. Yes, sir? Uh, what, uh, what was the name of that hotel? The Dickens Hotel, sir. I never heard of it in my life. But I, I imagine we'll be able to find it. Oh, Mr. Howard. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> We were about 40 miles from Schatz when the bus stopped to repair a tire. It was a lovely day. There was a stream just off the road where we sat down to have our lunch under the trees. And then the planes came. German planes. They dropped out of the sky, swarmed down toward the road and the bus. It didn't seem possible that they were trying to kill us. Rose? Yes, sir. I'm going back to the bus to see if I can get our bags. And children, while I'm gone, I want you to promise me, don't, don't look up that way. You won't now, will you? Stay right here now. Ronnie, I'm going to look. Don't, oh, Ronnie, don't. Sheila, look. There's dead people there. Dead people. <laughs> still there on the road when night came, and I herded the three children into a deserted old barn to sleep. But then I noticed that there were no longer three children, there were four. The fourth was a boy with a pale, thin face, a 
and the dull, glazed eyes of a child in terror. He couldn't seem to talk. He only repeated one phrase over and over. This this child, is he with us now? Yes, sir. I we brought him in, sir. He can't talk, Mr. Howard. That's all he says. Lezama, the German. Who is he? His name is Pierre. How did you learn that? He told us. But he can't talk. No, sir. May we speak to you privately, sir? Well, yes, of course. He was in the bus. Didn't you see him? The dead people, sir. They were his father and mother. I see. He can't speak, and and I don't think he can hear either. I see. Here. Here, lad. Let me see you. Look up here. They are in love. They are in love. Yes, 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 my boy. We'll take care of you now. There's nothing to fear now, my boy. Mr. Howard. Yes, Sheila. I can't go to sleep. Oh, but you must try. Yes. Mr. Howard. Yes. I'm sorry I was rude the other night about Rochester. Oh, it's quite all right now. Doesn't matter in the least. I was wrong, you know. No, no, not at all. I may very well have been wrong myself. There's so many of those American states. Kansas, Massachusetts. What's that Indian state? Massachusetts. Massachusetts, that's it. Seemed very likely there might be another named Rochester. No reason why not, you know. Oh, yes, sir. I remember it very well. You do? Oh, yes, indeed. A very important industrial state. Well, now, I'm not such an old fuddy-duddy after all, eh? I should say not. Yeah, my memory may have gone a bit ragged here and there, but when it comes to geography, you'll generally find I'm pretty good. Oh, I can see that, sir. Well, that's, that's very decent of you to acknowledge it, too. Thank you, sir. Well, good night, my girl. Good night, Mr. Howard. Rochester. In a few minutes, Mr. DeMille and our stars will bring us Act Two of The Pied Piper. And now, there's quite a crowd outside of Drummond's Chinese Theater here in Hollywood. A preview of an important new picture has just ended. People are watching their favorite stars coming out of the theater. Oh, lovely, lovely. Oh, just look at that white dress with a sequin. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, there goes Barbara Stanwyck. And there's Claudette Colbert, and oh, my goodness, if that isn't Sonia Henney. And later, on their way home... Oh, aren't they the glamorous people, though? They must have to spend simply hours every day on beauty care. Oh, they don't, though. Why, they're such busy people, they don't have time to fuss for hours. Why, Janie, just imagine. They use the same quick, easy care I do. Why, what do you mean, Sue? Why, Lux Toilet Soap. Active lather facial, the same kind screen stars take. The stars use Lux soap in their studio dressing rooms, and they use it at home, too. And that's a fact. Nine out of ten famous screen stars use Lux toilet soap regularly. Lux soap beauty care is the Hollywood way to a lovelier complexion. Recent tests prove that actually three out of four complexions became smoother and softer with this daily active lather care. It's true that screen stars haven't the time for elaborate daily complexion care, yet they can't take chances with complexion beauty, not for a minute. Here's what lovely young Teresa Wright says about it. A lot, girl? Indeed I am. These beauty facials do wonders for my skin. Here's all I do. Cover my face generously with a rich Lux soap lather, work it in thoroughly. Then I rinse with warm water, splash on cold, and pat with a towel to dry. Makes my skin feel so soft and smooth. Why not try this famous Hollywood complexion care? Get some Lux toilet soap tomorrow. Use it every day for the next few weeks. Then see if you're not delighted with the way the smooth, luxurious lather cares for your skin. Lux soap facials every day help skin to be fresher, lovelier, more appealing. 
We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Pied Piper, starring Frank Morgan as Mr. Howard, Margaret O'Brien as Sheila, and Senior Hasso as Nicole. As the Pied Piper of old led his children to a happy land beyond the mountain, so our Piper, Mr. Howard, tried to lead his children beyond the sea, to security, to safety, to England. It took us three days to reach Shot. I remembered then that I had a friend there, a young lady named Nicole Rougeron, whom I'd met on a vacation in San Moritz. I decided I would appeal to her for help, but I had to warn the children to be careful. Oh, yes. Here, 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 here. No excitement, please. We're in a very unpleasant situation. First, no more English, understand? If any of us has heard speaking English, well, it would be really in for it. Now, you understand that, don't you? Oh, yes, sir. Sheila? Yes, sir. That's it. Speak French. You may have room, sir. Well, not to me, not to me. <laughs> oh, what are you going to do? Well, I, uh, I suggest we play a little game. I shall be, or rather, I shall pretend to be very old and stone deaf. Can't hear a blasted word spoken to me, eh? Oh, good. And a little crazy, too. Crazy? Just a little, please. Well, uh, that might not be bad at that. Mouth open sort of thing, you mean. Might be very good indeed. I might babble a bit, too. You know. Oh, no, no, Mr. Howard. Oh, no? I think that might be a little too much. Oh, Overdoing it, eh? I thought it was rather good. <laughs> Stop that now. This is a serious business. Very serious business. Come along now. We'll try to find my friend, Mademoiselle Nicole. Monsieur Howard. Oh, monsieur. You, you remember me, Mademoiselle? But naturally, monsieur. Come in, please. Quickly. Well, uh, I'm not alone. Come in, and the little ones, too. Oh, well, come in, children. Yes, sir. It's cold. It's cold. It's cold. Mama, you remember Monsieur Howard? Monsieur Howard. Yes. Madame, I am happy Please, to... Please, if you speak English, close the door. Come inside. If you speak English, today is not safe. Not safe for any of us. I know, madame, and I have no wish No, no, to... no, no, please. We must be careful. That is all. Our friends are still our friends. We got this. Well, that's very kind of you, madame. But, monsieur, the children, you did not have them last year. Madame, some of them I did not have 24 hours ago. We're on our way to England. Allow me to introduce them. Madame Rougeron, Mademoiselle Nicole Rougeron, this is Sheila. That's a very fine girl. And this is her brother, Ronnie. This is Rose, this is Pierre, and this is... Who is this? Who marked you, Emma, bro? What? Where did you come from? I've never seen this one in my life. Sheila! Yes, sir. When did he join us? Well, um, he's been with us off and on since yesterday. I see. You mean, monsieur, you don't know who he is? No, but on this trip, that doesn't seem to be necessary. Boy, where did you spring from? Come on, speak up. It's Blake Hayley, Miss Miller. That is Dutch. His name is Villain, not William, Villain. Yes? How do you know that, Sheila? He told us. Listen to this, mademoiselle. Sheila, do you speak Dutch? Oh, no, sir. Do you understand Dutch? No, sir. But he told you? Yes, sir. Then in what language did he tell you? In no language. He just told us. Well, I suppose there must be some normal explanation for this system of communication. Very well, Willem. We'll do what we can for you. Of course, of course. The poor little ones. 
I wonder if they would like something to eat. Oh, yes. Yes. oh of course they do. Yes, they understand that all right, too. I am occasionally seized with the conviction that I am convoying guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. Mr. Howard, mm -hmm. you do understand that you are in great danger here? Yes, I do. And I promise in just a few minutes when I've rested a bit, we'll be on our way. But I was hoping to see Colonel Rougeron also. We have not heard from my father for several months. At that time, he was with his regiment before Metz. Oh. You, uh, you have my sympathy, mademoiselle. I understand. You see, you see, I, I too have suffered a loss. You remember my son, John? John? Yes, but... Well, I, I regret to inform you that he, uh, he, he was killed. He was in the RAF, you know, shot down two months ago. Gave a very decent account of himself, I understand, before they... before they got him. Then he... he is dead? He, excuse me, please. Mademoiselle Nicole was very kind. She helped us arrange for tickets on the train, and when we left Chat, she even came along with us. May I ask now where we are bound? To the channel, monsieur, the Brittany coast. There is someone there I know who might help. But was this necessary for you, this long, not very safe trip? Even if someone else could have done it, monsieur Howard, I would not permit it. It is a thing that I must do myself, myself alone. Mademoiselle, I appreciate this, even if I do not understand it. It would be just a year ago, wouldn't it, that Mount St. Amoris. But a long, long year, and a sad one. Yes, it's, uh, it's all quite hard to realize. Every now and then I feel it's all a dream, and presently we'll all wake up, and perhaps... John will walk in and we'll sit down and talk together again. I know. <laughs> it took free to bring him down, you know. You, uh, you remember him kindly, don't you? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. His, his letters and our love, our only visit together in Paris. You saw him in Paris? Once. Just once for three days. It was just before the invasion. Oh, we... We had a beautiful three days together. Well, I... I had no idea of that. No. We told nobody. In time, we would have, I suppose. We planned to, anyway. Then he went back. And I waited to hear from him. You know, it's funny. You wait and wait. Day after day, you wait for a letter, and then it comes. But it isn't from him. It's from his squadron. So for a long time, you don't open it. You just sit there and hold it, wishing you need never open it. Because you know that a letter from his squadron, from a friend, can have but one thing to tell. And then at last, you do open it. My dear child. And after that, the whole world is dark given to us before. Nicole's loss had been as great as mine, and I understood then why she had come with us. We went to a little town near the channel to the home of Nicole's uncle. With the children off to bed, he listened to our story, smoking his pipe, nodding quietly. Uh, and what do you propose now, Nicole? You have fishing boats, Uncle. You know young men who are not afraid. Can't you find one who will take Monsieur Hard and the children across the channel? I'm quite prepared to pay, you understand. And what is the price of a man's life, Monsieur? But, Uncle, they are little children. They must not be left here. Our country is no longer a place for children. Our country? Our country is no longer our country. You do not know, Nicole. You have not begun to learn what it is to live under the Bosch. <laughs> How do I know I can trust this man? But I know him, Uncle. I know him very, very well. How do I know I can trust you? Oh, but, Uncle. 
How do you know you can trust me? I refuse even to think such a thing. And to the boss, child, that is what happens? As I have said before, I have no wish to involve anyone else in my own personal problems. I shall, of course, leave the house. Uh, no, 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 please. Uh, let me think about it, monsieur. Uh, but, listen. Do you hear? That's a raid on Brest. It's the harbor. They're off to the ships. Why, those filthy... No, 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 monsieur. That's a British raid. Those are British planes. British? That's it. They're off to Hitler. That was the report in Brest today that he was there inspecting the invasion fleet. Well, after Mr. Schicklegruber, eh? Well... I should say it is. Those are British planes, Sheila, the RAF. Our planes? I've got to get a look at this by George. Yes, there they are. See? Bang! That's it, boys. Bang! Hit them again. Bang! Bang! By George, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. Bang! Late that night, when Nicole's uncle came to my room, I found the man and made all the arrangements. His name is Roque, and his boat is at a fishing village just ten kilometers from here. You and Nicole will meet him tomorrow in a cafe near the docks. Nicole knows the. Roque, Monsieur Roque. Nicole, ah, uh, que diable fat vous ici? Mon grand père, Monsieur Howard. Monsieur Howard ne comprend pas le français. Oh, yes. All right. You have the boat. The boat. It is the by bottom of the lighthouse. You understand? Yes. From the outside of the cafe, you will see the lighthouse. To the right. You understand? Yes. When do we start? Now, tonight. The sooner the better. Bonsoir. Bonsoir, Nicole. Bonsoir, Gampère. Bonsoir, Monsieur Roque. There is the lighthouse, Monsieur. And there is the boat. <laughs> Sheila, quiet. Stop here. Rocky. Here. This way. Well, I suppose this is goodbye. Bon voyage, monsieur. My child, won't you come with us to England? No, monsieur. I'm not English. I'm French. And you have told me yourself that in times of trouble, you should be in your own country and do what you can to help. This is where I belong. Right here. But afterward. Yes. Afterward I shall come. <laughs> Goodbye, my child. Goodbye, monsieur. Up there! Up! Mr. Howard. Shh! das Bote. Greifen Sie den Mann. Ja, Leutnant. That German's soldiers. So, you were leaving us, eh? You were English, yes? Well? I am English. This young lady is not. She is French. You will come with me. All of you. But I tell you, you that she... You come with me. Nick, this is it. Here is the under, Herr Leutnant. Uh, the boatman. You are English also? I am French. Boom, but my poor self, boss. Sergeant! Now, monsieur, you will come this way. Please. Mr. Howard, if we got it, haven't we? Well, it, it rather looks that way, <laughs> Sheila. Oh, Pierre. Pierre. Les hommes. Les hommes. Les hommes. Les hommes. In a few moments, Mr. DeMille and our stars will return in Act Three of The Pied Piper. And now, a tired businessman, a really tired businessman, is being reminded of a promise. I'm so glad you got home a little early, dear. We promised the Sloans we'd go with them to that political meeting tonight. Oh, say, Mary, do we have to go to that? It's been an awful day. I'm fagged out. Oh, wait and see how you feel after dinner. It's time for a shower if you want one, Jim. I just put fresh towels and soap in the bathroom. On the road to Mandalay. Oh, boy, this soap sure knows how to lather. Where the flying fishes play and... You're all dressed up. That's a new tie. Well, we're going out, aren't we? <laughs> Say, Mary, when do we eat? You know, that shower kind of pepped me up. I thought it would. A Lux soap bath always does the trick for me. There's nothing like a refreshing Lux toilet soap bath to cure that all-in, end-of-the-day feeling. 
And you're sure to make a hit with the men folks in your family if you put fine white Lux toilet soap in the shower or tub. A man likes the rich, creamy lather, the way it carries away dust and grime in a jiffy. Even in hard water, Lux soap gives quick, abundant lather. Lux, you see, is a quality soap made only of the finest ingredients. But the whole family can enjoy it as a luxurious bath soap because it's thrifty to use. Lux toilet soap is hard milled. It doesn't get mushy or soft. Each smooth white cake can be used to the last thin sliver. Why not put Lux toilet soap on your shopping list tomorrow? And now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. After the play, we'll have an answer to the burning question of the evening as propounded to Frank Morgan by one of his leading ladies, Margaret O'Brien. It's a little personal, but I think you'll be allowed to listen in. And now, here's the third act of The Pied Piper, starring Frank Morgan as Mr. Howard, Margaret O'Brien as Sheila, and Senior Hasso as Nicole. The land of hope lay just across the channel, a few miles of water between refuge and despair. But Mr. Howard and the children... We're on the wrong side. They brought us to a house in the town, the headquarters of the Gestapo. The children and Nicole and Roque and I. They took us before a major who sat smiling at us from behind his desk. Very touching, yes. A lovely group of children, mein Herr. Well, I suppose you know that Charandon has been arrested. I haven't the foggiest idea what you're talking about. Nor have you ever heard of Major Cochran, I suppose, of Army Intelligence War Office in London. No. Your memory obviously needs freshening. An English gentleman traveling across France with five children anxious only to get home. A pretty and most disarming device. It happens to be the truth. Who are these children? Where did you get them? To... The two English children belong to friends of mine. The other... You insist on that absurd story. You asked for the truth, didn't you? Yes, I should get it. You see, we know who sent the information to the English of the Führer's visit to the fleet at Brest. We know who caused that raid. You and Charendon. What we do not know is how that message was passed through to England. That is what you are going to tell us, Mr. Englishman. And as soon as it is told, the pain will stop, not before. Take them away. Mr. Beck, I say one question, please. Did they get him? Get whom? Hitler. Of course not. Oh, that's too bad. <laughs> they took us out of the room, and then they brought me alone to another room down the hall and left me. There was a man sitting there. I'm afraid you have the advantage of me, sir. <laughs> no, I'm English, too. Half at any rate. English? What are you doing here? Waiting to be shot. Oh, you're Challender. You've heard of me. I'm supposed to be mixed up with you in some way. That raid on the ships. Too bad we didn't get the little beggar. You mean you were responsible for that, really? Why, help. There's no point in denying it now. Only I wish they'd stop throwing innocent people in this room with me on the theory that they're going to convict themselves. Really, I look for better things from you, Major Deason. More ingenious. I say, are you feeling all right? Quite. I I'm assuming, of course, there's a microphone in this room somewhere. Oh. They're listening to us right now. Yes. You're wasting your time, Major. This man knows nothing about my affairs. But I will tell you this. The English will be back here, and I warn you, they'll not be as gentle as they were after the last war. They'll deal with you this time as they would with vermin. And if you kill this old man, I assure you, you'll be hanged publicly, and your body left to rot on the scaffold as a warning to your other murderers. <laughs> that ought to hold him. You're a very rash young man. Oh, I'm in for it anyway. <laughs> At least I can get a bit of satisfaction out of it. Major had evidently heard enough. A few minutes later, he sent for me. They're going a little bored with your friend Chandon. Really? If I were in your place, I would not dismiss what he says too lightly. Look out of the window there. A very pleasant garden, isn't it? Very. That is where your friend, Mr. Chandon, is going to die in just a few minutes. 
unless you decide to help him. I know nothing whatever of his work or how he went about it. Nor if I knew would I tell you. Look, they're bringing him out. You see? The very little thing that I ask. Tell me how he got the information out of France, and I will stop this execution. I've told you truthfully, I do not know. Huh? You haven't much time. Nobody would ever know. I promise you. Can't you understand? I know nothing. As you wish. Just a few seconds now. Are you going to tell me? Well? Too late, I'm afraid. Fire! Uh, Pity, come to the window. Would you like to see what you've done? Swine. Foul, filthy swine. Sit down. You puzzle me, really. If you are a spy, you are at least a very clever one. What did you intend to do with those children? What? The children? What did you plan to do with them? I don't know. I hadn't thought. Send them to America, I suppose. America? Why America? Well, I, I have a married daughter who lives in a district called Long Island. She would have made a home for them until the war was over. Are you seriously asking me to believe that a woman in America would make a home for five dirty little children that you've picked up? I'm no longer interested in what you believe. Listen, I'll confess anything you wish if you'll only let them go. And Mademoiselle, too. If you'll do that, I'll confess to anything you say. It is impossible. I simply do not know what to make of you. I can only say that you must be a very brave man to make such an offer. No, no, not brave. Just old. The Major was not finished with me yet. The next day I saw him again, I do not alone. Believe. One word of your story about these children, particularly about your plan to send them to America. I'll say anything you wish if you'll only let them go. What about the Jewish child? Jewish? Which Jewish child? The dark one. Is he Jewish? It didn't occur to me to ask. But in America, would they accept a Jewish child? I don't believe that they'd turn down any child, even a German. Even a German? Are you... Positive of that? Yes. Mr. Hubbard, how would you like to continue your trip to England? Not without the children. And Mademoiselle? No, she wants to stay here in France. But if I were to let you go to England with the children, would you be grateful enough to do me a small step? That would depend on what it was. There's a certain person to be taken to America... I do not want to advertise her journey, but... If you think for one second that I would introduce a German agent into America, you're even a greater fool than I she thought you were. She can hardly act as an agent. She's only five years old. Five? Yeah. Now, listen carefully. This little girl is my niece. Her father, my younger brother, is dead. Her mother, we learned later, was not wholly Aryan. So we were compelled to, to dispose of her. But the unfortunate problem of the child remains. Half Aryan, half Jewish. She happens to be a sweet child, and I would feel better if she were with my older brother in the United States. He is an American citizen. She would be safer, you mean. As you wish. His name is Rupert Deason. He now has a business, a grocery, in a city named Rochester in New York State. City? The city of Rochester, New York. Are you positive? Of course I'm positive. What are you talking about? Have you not ever heard of it? Oh, yes, yes, certainly I've heard of it. <clears throat> His address is 600 North 3rd Street. And that is where I want her to go. Meanwhile, Mademoiselle may return to her home in shop. And no harm will come to her. Not unless you are foolish enough to tell anyone of this arrangement. Very well. I should be very glad to take the child and see that she's delivered to her uncle. What is your address in London? I shall send for you when we arrive there. 42 Curzon Street. Yours, I assume, will be a cell in the Tower of London. We were released that night, all of us. Roque had the boat ready, and we stood lined up on the deck waiting for the little girl we were to take with us. She arrived with the Major, a tiny child, carrying a doll in her arms. Oh, this must be Anna. How do you do, Anna? How do you do, Anna? 
pale ship there. <laughs> oh, 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 children, <laughs> children, stop it. Stop it immediately. Major Disney, hadn't you better explain to Anna that from now on that salute will be out of place? Very well. Anna, from now on, brauchst du nicht mehr Heil Hitler zu sagen. Du kommst unter Menschen, die das nicht verstehen. Nicht mehr? <laughs> oh, gut, gut. <laughs> <laughs> get aboard. I want to see you get away. All of you, get aboard. Uh, goodbye, Nicole. Goodbye. All of this I know you have done for my boy. And for him, I thank you. Some for him. Some for you, too. You know, once I thought I could never be another man as fine and as brave as your son. But I was wrong. And it wasn't all for you either. It was for the children. Somehow, somehow they represent hope. Hope for the future. You are the past. I'm the present. And they are the future. So we must take very, very good care of them. I have not all night, please. Au revoir, my dear. You'll, you'll come to see me when it's all over and we'll talk about John. Oh, yes. One more thing. The Englishman. Yeah. There must be no trickery. If one word of this appears, it will be the concentration camp for your young lady. Remember that. And if anything happens to my young lady and I hear of it, this whole story will be in the papers and on the shortwave radio mentioning you by name. And you remember that. You dare threaten me? You dare threaten me, didn't you? Oh, that's so. Au revoir, au revoir, good luck and happiness. Au revoir, Nicole. Au revoir, Bye. 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 Well, we're on our way, children. I think you'd all better go below and see if you can't get some sleep. We have to take off our clothes tonight. No, you may sleep with them on tonight. Good night, Good night, dear. Good night. Good night my dear. Good night, little Anna. We're all friends now. Not here, Howard. Yeah. Oh, uh, Sheila. Yes, sir? There's, uh, there's a little matter I think I ought to clear up with you. You remember our little discussion regarding Rochester? But yes, Mr. Howard, but I told you. I know, but it, it, it seems that... We were both wrong. Really? Yes, I happened to be talking it over with a fellow the other night. A fellow knew all about it. It's not a state at all, it's a city. A city in New York State. Well, now, isn't that peculiar that we both made that mistake? <laughs> You're really a very extraordinary girl, Sheila. And I'm very fond of you. And I apologize to you. We reached the English coast the next morning, and in two weeks I'd seen them all off to America. That was four years ago. I've been in government work since then. I, uh, I knit. <laughs> I hear from the children quite often. Just yesterday I had six birthday cards. Six cards in round, childish hand, wishing me joy for the coming year. I wish them joy, too. Joy for the coming year and for all the years that they shall know and I shall not. For this is what we are fighting for, and this is our prayer, that there shall be a future full of years for children of every land and of every creed, that they shall know joy and laughter and a bright new world. Sheila must have gone to considerable trouble in sending me her card. It was postmarked Rochester, New York. Really an amazing child. And now our stars, Frank Morgan, Margaret O'Brien, and Senior Hasso come to the footlights to receive our thanks and to help answer a question that I'm sure has been on all our minds. Tell me, Frank, are you preparing to lose an election bet? Election bet? Certainly not. 
Not honestly. I mean honestly not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might report that Mr. Morgan brings to our footlights the most luxurious chin foliage ever seen on the stage of the Lux Radio Theater. <laughs> well, thank you, C.B. I didn't think you'd notice it. It's the beard for Mr. Morgan. What? What's the beard for, Mr. Morgan? Well, it's, uh, it's for a picture I'm growing. I mean, I'm making. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you can talk through it. <laughs> <laughs> talk through it? Why, <laughs> down on his ranch, Mr. Morgan is one of the best hog callers in the county. Well, thank you, C.B. Can you really call hogs, Mr. Morgan? Miss Hasso and I call hogs. They come running with apples in their mouths all set for roasting. <laughs> Would you like to hear me? Yes. Yeah. Look at this week, Mrs. Grace Wego. What? <laughs> Quiet, please. You'll miss the delicate inflictions. Now. Suey, 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 suey. Suey, 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 suey. There, I was so convincing, I almost thought I heard the patter of their tiny feet. Do you think you could do it, Margaret? Well, I'll try. Oh, yes. Go ahead, Margaret. Do it. All right. Uh, suey, suey, suey. <laughs> <laughs> My word, they're coming. Look out, everybody. <laughs> you see, Frank, Margaret, Margaret's quite a versatile actress. She can even go you one better on hog calling. <laughs> can you call hogs, Miss Hasso? No, Margaret. Not in English. Only in Swedish. Ah, but Miss Hasso is a very distinguished actress, Margaret. She's won every award for acting that Sweden offers. And she's appearing now in the Metro Golden Mayor picture, Seventh Cross. You know, CB, George G. Nathan calls Miss Hasso the most attractive new foreign actress in America. Well, you only have to see the story of Dr. Wassel to know that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, one of the reasons for that attractiveness, Frank. Yeah, I know, I know. Lux soap. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. You're very kind. But it is true that I've used Lux toilet soap ever since I came to America. Same here. <laughs> you, you used it ever since you came to America, Margaret? Yes, ever since I forgot to wash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, well I, uh, I'm sure, Margaret, that can't be often, judging from your, the memory you've shown here tonight. Can you plumb up your memory and tell us what's on Lux next Monday night, C.B.? Now, for next Monday night, Frank, we, we have one of the most dramatic stories of modern times. The universal screen hit, Magnificent Obsession. And our stars will be Claudette Colbert and Don Amici. It's a gripping love story in which a man sacrifices himself for a woman and loses her. But in devoting his life to helping others, achieves a final and dramatic happiness. Sounds like November 13th is a lucky number, C.B. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Your hug calling certainly brought home the bacon. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Donna Michi and Claudette Colbert in Magnificent Obsession. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Here's an important reminder from your local post office. Christmas mailing this year is expected to top the 1943 holiday volume by 25%. So if you want to be sure that your gifts reach their destination on time, mail them during this coming month, no later than December 1st. The Pied Piper was presented through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John N. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Magnificent Obsession with Claudette Colbert and John Amici. Fry. Grand for cake and pie. Fry. Every time you fry. Fry. It's the shortening by. Yes, ma'am. New spry cakes are lighter, better tasting. Spry pastry is so tender and flaky. Spry fried foods are crispier, so digestible. So be a better cook. Bake and fry with spry. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of The Magnificent Obsession with Claudette Colbert and Don Amici. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.